And now I'd like to talk about someone ever so briefly before we do a couple questions that I consider, and I never say this on the show because I don't like, I, I think it's a, a hilarious characterization to give to people, but I think this person deserves it almost more than anyone else I've ever talked about. And, and this is how I'm going to characterize this man. He was a great American. And uh, it's not often that I say that, and I wouldn't say it about a lot of people. Um, when Dick Cheney passes, for instance, I won't be saying it about Dick Cheney. <laughs> Uh, or a lot of people, when Lloyd Blankfein passes or any of the heads of any of these corporations or any of the 1,426 billionaires, they are not great Americans. They're not all Americans, whatever. The point is this. Um, he was a great American. What makes a great American, Greg? Being honest and speaking your mind and not being a fucking fuckstick. <laughs> Sticking up for the poor, the downtrodden, the voiceless women, people in prison, and people who have no other recourse in the world because they don't have access to the media or the money or the fucking uh, uh, ability to reach out to everyone else. That's what being a great American is. Um, you know many great Americans in your life. If you're a nurse, you're a great American. If you w if work in the transportation industry, you're a great American. If you fucking help people across the street, you're a great American. Uh, everyone I meet in Ohio is so friendly and hardworking. And to me, that's what a great American is. People who make a lot of money, um, hooray. <laughs> that doesn't make you great. You know what I mean? Uh, as the song goes, gold won't buy you happiness when you're growing old. Um, uh, mammon is just for here. Uh, and, and as Gene Fowler, the writer, immortally said, money is to be thrown from the rear platforms of speeding locomotives. Um, what makes a great American is that they care and that they stick to their fucking guns. Um, it doesn't mean that you wave the flag. Waving the flag, any idiot can wave a flag. Any idiot can fucking carry a gun and shoot someone. Any idiot can be violent. Any, any idiot can be jingoistic. Any idiot can be a warmonger. War is not what makes the world great. Peace and poetry and connecting with one another is what makes the world great. Not fucking war. Pete Seeger passed away this week. Pete Seeger is encompassing us in a, in a giant velvet glow all around the globe. Uh, he really was a great American. He was friends with uh, Woody Guthrie. And Woody Guthrie wrote, of course, This Land is Your Land. The last verse of This Land is Your Land, um, he says, uh, I saw a sign and it said, uh, no trespassing. On the other sign, it didn't say nothing. And that meant uh, we're not allowed to go where rich people own shit, but we can go where we want, right? And no one ever wants them to sing the last two verses because Woody Guthrie was a commie. And uh, there were communists in this country once upon a time. We were allowed to hold a bunch of differing opinions, and there were lots of different parties instead of two crappy parties that reflect the same giant political plutocratic uh, bullshit. There's still lots of parties, and there's still lots of differing opinions. It's just that we haven't much choice when we get to the ballot box. Woody Guthrie was uh, good friends with Pete Seeger. They met during the war. And Woody Guthrie didn't do gigs, per se. Like, he didn't do gigs for money. He would show up at a migrant farmer's camp, for instance, during the Dust Bowl, because he was an okay. And, uh, uh, and when the Dust Bowl happened in the United States, and, and millions of people were displaced from the middle of America and had to move to the West Coast in Arizona and whatnot, uh, Woody Guthrie would go to those camps and just sing for free. Or he'd go to a union meeting and sing at that. Or he'd go to the Navy and sing for them. He'd just sing for people. It wasn't a matter of, uh, I want a bunch of money, I'm doing a concert and shit. Uh, I'm not saying he was altruistic and on the extreme. Uh, I'm, I'm just saying that's what he did. And Pete Seeger did the same thing. Um, music for them wasn't a, a pastime. Music for them wasn't a profession. Music was their life. People sang along with Woody Guthrie and Pete Seeger. Pete Seeger was not someone who came to do a concert that you were just supposed to sit there. Pete Seeger made you sing every goddamn song. A lot of people don't like to sing or clap along. If you went to a Pete Seeger concert, goddamn it, you were going to sing Michael Rowe, your fucking boat ashore. <laughs> You're going to sing Guantanamera. You're going to sing Turn, Turn, Turn. He wrote or concocted or collated or helped write uh, uh, If I Had a Hammer and Turn, 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 which the birds had a big hit with, which actually he didn't write because it's from the book of Ecclesiastes, which was written by a Greek scholar some 2,000 years ago. So it's one of the great pop hits that was written 2,000 years ago. <laughs> For every season, Turn, 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 right? He says, and he says in the song, A Time to Kill. Hmm, how about that? So... Uh, 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 Woody Guthrie, though, what I'm getting at is on Woody Guthrie's guitar, uh, because he sang during the war and during the 30s when the rising tide of fascism was threatening the world, uh, not the rising tide of fascism that led to Kristallnacht, not the kind that threatens the 1% billionaires of the world, but the actual rising tide of fascism. Um, Woody Guthrie's guitar had a sign on it, or was written on it, that said, this machine kills fascists, right? Uh, and what, what's that song that Billy Bragg did uh, by Woody Guthrie? They wrote the lyrics to... Uh, uh, 
you, you fascists are bound to lose. Um, and I want to tell you what the definition of fascism is, just so we know and we're clear on it, because we try to read definitions on the show, because a lot of times words get bandied about, like plutocracy and things like that, and no one has any idea what they mean because no one ever stops to fucking tell you what they mean. Fascism is this. This is from the online dictionary. Fascism, pronounced fascism, noun. Um, a governmental system led by a dictator having complete power, forcibly suppressing opposition and criticism, regimenting all industry, commerce, etc., and emphasizing an aggressive nationalism and often racism. Does that sound familiar to anyone? <laughs> Are you saying that we have a dictator? No. But listen to this part again. Forcibly suppressing opposition and criticism, regimenting all industry, commerce, and emphasizing aggressive nationalism and often racism. We're supposed to love our country all the time. We're supposed to love it unconditionally. Um, Then why do they search us at the airport and treat us like suspects if it's our country? They don't search us when we take a bus. They don't search us when we take a car. They have the opportunity to, so they fuck with us. That's what they do. It has nothing to do with security at all. You're no more secure on a plane than you are on a fucking bicycle. Um, and the crowd goes quiet again. Uh, a fascist is a person who believes or sympathizes with fascism, uh, a member of a fascist movement, or a person who is dictatorial or has extreme right-wing views. I didn't make that up. Let me read it to you. It's the third definition. A person who is dictatorial or has extreme right-wing views is a fascist. Uh, in other words, Mussolini, Hitler, blah, 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 blah. A political movement that employs the principles and methods of fascism, especially when... Established by Mussolini, DDD. The origin, Italian fascismo, equivalent to fascist bundle. Um, when in Roman days, um, when a Roman uh, a high person, a senator, uh, a procurator, a tribune, whatever, would walk down the street, um, they had uh, lictors uh, who were men uh, who walked in front of them with their badges of office. The badge of office in Rome was a bunch of sticks in a bundle. That is a fascist. A fascist. A fascist is a bunch of sticks in a bundle. You can see them on our dollar bill. Um, on our dollar bill, you'll see an eagle, an imperial eagle, holding a bunch of fucking arrows in one hand. If you were in ancient Rome, you would recognize the symbol. Any ancient Roman transported to America would recognize the symbol on our dollar bill, if I have any left. Uh, I don't, but there you are. Uh, a, a bundle of arrows and a fucking... Because the, the symbol of imperial Rome was a, an eagle. Funny how the symbol of America is an imperial eagle. Um, the machine... Uh, uh, so Pete Seeger uh, went one further because he was good friends with Woody Guthrie. Woody Guthrie joined a band with him and they sang during the war. And Woody Guthrie uh, joined Pete Seeger's band and said to them after a couple gigs, do you guys ever rehearse? <laughs> yeah, because they played like hillbilly music. Uh, Pete Seeger on his guitar uh, had... This machine surrounds hate and forces it to surrender. Uh, Mark Radcliffe, uh, who's a DJ and a good friend of mine in Britain, said this about Pete Seeger. He repeatedly put put his career, his reputation, and his personal security on the line so he could play a significant musical part in campaigns for civil rights, environmental awareness, and peace. He lives behind a canon of songs that are both essential and true, and his contribution to folk music will be felt far into the future. Campaigns for civil rights, environmental awareness, and peace. He was never pro-war or pro-wealth or pro-1%. He was for environmental awareness and peace and civil rights because those are human things to be for. Uh, Supporting the status quo of the giant military industrial complex is no great accomplishment. And if that is what you're about in your lifetime, you're going to have to answer to a higher power than fucking me and my shitty moral liberal fucking bullshit West Coast judgment. You're going to have to face whatever you have to face in the afterworld. Uh, just know that there's better things to be for than fucking corporations and money and shit like that. Oh. We all know that. Uh, Pete Seeger, seven decades, a musical and political icon. If I had a hammer, where have all the flowers gone? Uh, really, he said uh, d- that he's... Um, his philosophy was defiant optimism because I talk a lot about the rich on the show and I'm always bumming people out and it's always the boring preacher part and shit like that. But at the same time, I want uh, to embrace what Pete Seeger said about defiant optimism. I believe the world will only get better. Why, Greg? Why? Because we have a black president and there's women in, in the government now and gay people get to hold positions and we're recognizing that people are human all over the world. The fact that Russia is being homophobic about this Olympics has not gone unnoticed. It would have 25 years ago. It, it would have. It would have. No one would have cared. No one would have cared about homophobia then. 
Now they do. Uh, so everything gets better all the time. The generation of young people, as I've said a million times on the show, the people that are in their teens and 20s don't give a fuck about all the shit that we care about as middle-aged people. They don't care about gay rights, and they don't care about mar- medical marijuana, and they don't care about women having spots in the workplace. They're cool with it. You know what I mean? That's what's going to happen in 30 years' time. When my generation is finally... F- well, the people older than me are dead, but when my generation's dead, the world's going to be better, I think. <laughs> That's my defiant optimism. Uh, there's a wonderful parable in the New Testament... The sower scatters seeds. Some seeds fall on the pathway and get stamped on, and they don't grow. Some fall on the rocks, and they don't grow. But some seeds fall on the fallow ground, and they grow and multiply a thousandfold. Who knows where some good little thing that you've done may bring results years later that you've never dreamed of. No act of kindness goes unrewarded or unnoted in the universe. But every act of cruelty and every act of horrible self-interest does not lead to greater things. Um, Seeger led an illustrious musical career. In the 40s, he almanac singers with Woody Guthrie. He formed the Weavers. In the 50s, he was blacklisted after he opposed Senator Joe McCarthy's political witch hunt and was almost jailed for refusing to answer questions before the House Un-American Activities Committee. Um, he became a prominent civil rights activist. He was brought in front of the House Un-American Activities Committee, and, they, and he had served, by the way, in World War II. So I don't know what your definition of a patriot is. Let's look here in the Contradictionary and see what a patriot is. Here it says, a patriot, an individual willing to give up freedom without a fight. C, Patriot Act. I think that uh, Pete Seeger was the best kind of patriot because he tried to bring people together. He felt that every time he sang, it was a political act, not an act of division and not an act of uh, of divisiveness of setting one side against another, which I've done tonight, granted. Uh, but rather uh, a culmination of bringing people together and having people sing together. Uh, he sang for children quite a lot, but he, of course, was brought against uh, charges of the House Un-American Activities Committee because he had been in the Communist Party. And he said he was a communist with a small c. When they interrogated him, he refused to answer their questions. You can read the transcript if you go online. Go online and look up Pete Seeger, the transcript against the... Uh, yes, what is it you want, my darling? You can't wait to the end? Go ahead. What's outweighed by what? A lot of his songs were recorded by someone besides him about a year before. Oh, to be sure. As I said, he collated and collected songs. He was a collector of American songs. I don't know that he would say, he, he, even he would say he was an author. Well, I'm a big fan, but he's... I, 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 would, I wouldn't say plagiarized. Let's talk about Bob Dylan. He completely plagiarized songs. Or the Rolling Stones do Robert Johnson songs without giving Robert Johnson any fucking credit at all. I mean, for goodness sakes, we're splitting fucking hairs here. Let me make my giant overarching point, and then I'll allow you to fucking jump in here. I mean, yes, he plagiarized songs, but in plagiarizing them, popularized them. He took Lead Belly song, the Lead Belly song, Goodnight Irene, which is a song written way before that, or We Shall Overcome, which was written far before he ever made it popular. I mean, but... but, but Plagiarizing to me would mean he did it for his own personal profit and gain as opposed to uh, 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 trying to uh, 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 shine a light on those songs and bring them to people all over the world, which he did quite successfully. And by the way, never didn't give fucking credit to the people he took the songs from. So it's a different matter to fucking take somebody's idea, steal it, and make a bunch of money off it and then go, I fucking wrote that, which I don't think he ever did. When Peter, Paul, and Mary did uh, Where Have All the Fucking Flowers Gone, um, they finally realized that he had never put his name on the publishing rights. So they did, and they put his name on, and they gave him the money for it. So I wouldn't say that he was the most ungenerous performer in the world. And the fact that you're even jumping in to fucking interrupt me during this part with this fucking splitting hairs bullshit is kind of rubbing me the wrong way a little bit. And I'm about to plagiarize you with my cock. So, no, I get what you're saying, but I, let, let's, not, let's not split hairs over the fucking word plagiarizing. He was a popularizer of songs. He was a collector of songs. He was a friend of Alan Lomax. Alan Lomax's father... Um, collected cowboy songs like Home on the Range and things like that. Is that plagiarizing for him to collect a song that someone else sang so that we could all know fucking Home on the Range? I think we all still know Home on the Range and, and most people could probably crack off a couple of lines of it. That song's 150, 200 years old. Alan Lomax's son became a 
a collector of songs for the Smithsonian and went around the country listening to sharecroppers and black people and miners and poor people in the Appalachians and collected all those songs. And Pete Seeger was not immune to that. And Pete Seeger knew him and also got involved in that area. What he called it was old, his brother called it old timey music, what we would call folk music. The collection of the American consciousness and the American fucking experience in song. And I'm talking about songs about building railroads, fucking working on things, being a woman, all those things, being a union person. That's not plagiarism. That's popularism. That's popularizing fucking songs so that everyone can understand and enjoy them, in my opinion. Um, if he just stole the fucking song, like the Stones did with fucking Love in Vain and shit, and put their fucking names on it, and Robert Johnson fucking wrote that song, and they got all the money for it, that's more plagiarizing. Bob, how many fucking Bob Dylan songs are fucking public domain that he fucking stole and shit like that? You're going to watch me fucking explode here, man. <laughs> Trying to talk about fucking Pete Seeger here. Are you, a, are you a folk singer? Is that what the deal is? You're angry about that? I'm a fan of Seeger, bigger fan of yours. But he Thank you, brother. <laughs> he may well have done that. And in fact, let's just say he did do that. He capitalized on those songs. But by capitalizing on them and by playing all around the world... All right, let me put it this way, bro, Haim. Were you ever called in front of a fucking house committee to, to uh, uh, defend your own patriotism? Were you ever barred from making a livelihood because of your political views? Well, if you haven't been, then you haven't gone through what Pete Seeger went through, which was constant fucking harassment, phone tapping, and bullshit from the government for 50 fucking years. He wasn't allowed on TV. There was a TV show called Hootenanny in the early 60s. Yeah, when there were shows like Shindig and Where the Action Is and shit. Before that, when the folks thing came out, uh, and, and the Kingston Trio and Peter, Paul, and Mary, and all of your favorite artists like Joni Mitchell and Bob Dylan and shit like that, who are folk artists, um, are all in the sphere and the circle of Pete Seeger and Woody Guthrie, right? There was a show called Hootenanny, where there people come on with banjos and play fucking uh, folk songs. They wouldn't put Pete Seeger on that show. Because they didn't think he was patriotic enough. And if you can believe this, they wanted him to sign a loyalty oath before he could appear on a show called Hootenanny. <laughs> which he would not do. Um, he was also on the Smother Brothers show during the Vietnam War. And he sang a song called Across the Big Muddy. Which is a song about a colonel making a unit go across a river. until, And even though everyone in the unit's going, we're going to die, the river's too muddy. And then the colonel dies and the sergeant goes, fuck it, we're going back to the other side. <laughs> And the line that they keep coming back to is, and the big fool says, push on. Well, Lyndon Johnson thought the song was about him <laughs> and the Vietnam War. And so he recorded it. He put it on the show. CBS bravely pulled it. Well, Tommy and Dickie Smothers fucking uh, vouched for it and got him back on the show. And he came back on and he sang the goddamn song one more time on the show. And they played it. And he was blacklisted from television, like Paul Robeson, who was also a communist and another great American who popularized uh, the songs of Jerome Kern, particularly Old Man River from the musical Showboat, which is a song about slaves, right, pulling barges down the fucking river and whatnot. Uh, Paul Robeson had his passport taken away from him for eight years, so he could not find gainful employment overseas, which is where he was booked. And this country made damn sure that he couldn't get work here. So what I'm getting at is that the United States government persecutes people who exert their free will and their civil right to fucking discuss and describe what they think is uh, the inequities of this society. And that Pete Seeger despite his plagiarism of folk songs, um, was persecuted in that regard, stood tall through all of that, and fucking shepherded the folk movement into existence in America, carried on playing, and then became a mad civil rights activist and environmentalist, and did nothing but enrich this country in a million different ways, and not as a warmonger, and he served... If your definition of someone who's a patriot is someone who served in the armed forces, he served in the goddamn armed forces. And by the way, he wasn't poor. He was from a middle-class family. Um, a 20th century troubadour who inspired and led a renaissance of folk music with his trademark five-string banjo and songs of love, peace, brotherhood, work, and protest. Um, they called him America's Conscience. Um, tall and read thin. He was recognized top-selling records, most enduring and best-loved folk singers. He was also one of the few remaining links to two of the 20th century's early giants of American folk music. Huddy Ledbetter. Uh, the black ex-convert from Texas and Louisiana, better known as Lead Belly, and Woody Guthrie, the minstrel songwriter from Oklahoma. Good Night, I Ring was a Lead Belly tune Mr. Seeger adapted for the Weavers. <laughs> Mr. Guthrie learned to express political and social criticism through music and song. Over time, dissent and left-wing expression became hallmarks of his artistic repertoire during the anti-communist Red Scare of the 50s. Well, there's a Red Scare in every decade. 
ladies and gentlemen. There's a Red Scare in every era. There wasn't just a Red Scare in the 50s. In every decade, people have been called on the fucking carpet for not being patriotic enough or not being jingoistic enough. And I'm very serious when I say this. After 9-11, you may remember Janine Garofalo was pilloried on TV for actually going on and saying, I don't think we should be fighting a war with Iraq. That's all she said was that maybe we shouldn't fight a war. And everybody, oh my God, she hates America. I hate America. First of all, loving America is easy. Any moron can do it. Standing up for what America is about, which is fucking uh, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore and all that. Um, we're supposed to be about equality, right? Not about exclusion. And so uh, I really feel like in every decade, including now, including now, people who don't support the dominant paradigm and people who don't support the rich and their quest for everlasting wealth are pilloried and fucking made fun of. Uh, they're, they're, they're lunatics. Uh, they, oh, they're in a park. They're shitting in the park. They're fucking, they're homeless people. They're, they're trust fund kids. They're blah, 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 blah. You never hear the end of that, do you, on the fucking news? No one ever goes, hey, by the way, we have the right to fucking stand out in the street and say the government's wrong. It's in the Constitution. We have the right not to have our shit spied on every goddamn moment of the day. It's in the Constitution. We have that right. It's guaranteed to us. You don't have to answer any questions. In my opinion, you don't have to submit to the fucking uh, uh, airport security checks. But you do, and if you want to get on the goddamn plane. But it's completely unconstitutional in every goddamn way. Why, in heaven's name, would you ever want to live in a country where they can feel up children for being terrorists? Why would you want your grandmother? And what's the cutoff date now? If you're 74, you don't have to take your shoes off when you go through the airport. But if you're 73, you do. So all terrorists are under the age of 74. There's no rhyme or reason or logic to anything the government does to us. And I mean to us. Uh, And I really feel like that's why Pete Seeger is a great American. Uh, whether leading a sing-along of college students or performing in a formal concert, he tried to recreate the atmosphere in which his songs were first sung. He sang in a light, pleasing baritone. Put his song on people's lips instead of their ears. He helped bring dozens of classics into the idiom. These included Guthrie's This Land Is Your Land, So Long It's Been Too Good to Know You, Midnight Special, On Top of Old Smokey, Zena Zena Zena, the Hebrew song, the Zulu hit Wimowe, which was Mabube, yes, and he plagiarized it from the Africans. <laughs> I know an old lady who swallowed a fly and waist deep in the big muddy. I, I mispronounced it earlier. It's way steep in the big money. Uh, it was known in the original form as the hammer song. Uh, this is If I Had a Hammer. Made up at the piano one afternoon with the Weaver's colleague, Lee Hayes. The lyrics drew attention of federal investigators. The lyrics drew attention of federal investigators to the song If I Had a Hammer. I'd hammer out justice. I'd hammer out freedom. I'd hammer out love between my brothers and my sisters. That's how the song goes. And this is why. Words such as peace and freedom were codes for left-wing subversives and communists. This isn't in ancient history, you guys. This is in people's lifetimes. Um, Peace and freedom are what we should be fighting for all the time. We want the troops to come home so they don't die. We want peace so that we're not engaged in these epic wars that waste all of our money and make the billionaires even richer than they are. Um, Why are peace and freedom uh, uh, hallmarks of left-wing people who are seditious and shit like that? Shouldn't even... Rich people want peace and freedom so that there can be more happy worker drones who go singing the corporate anthem every morning on the Google bus and do their fucking bidding every day and look at their phone all the time and never take a, pay any attention to everyone around them. Isn't that what the corporations want? Uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary recorded a revised version of 62. Dee, 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 dee. Political descent had been a family tradition. A great-grandfather was a 19th century abolitionist. Uh, an abolitionist means he was against slavery. His great-grandfather was against slavery. Uh, this World War I poet, Alan Seeger, wrote, I have a rendezvous with death, was his uncle. As a child, he accompanied his father and visits a friend in the city. He recalled hearing the folk song John Henry played on the harmonica by artist Thomas Hart Benton in Greenwich Village. You know who Thomas Hart Benton is. Um, he's a famous American artist. Mr. Seeger attended a folk music festival in Asheville, North Carolina in 1935, and he encountered the five-string banjo. He always played the banjo. He once said he learned a little something from everybody, and along the way he acquired a vast repertoire of ballads, spirituals, and blues songs. Guthrie and Ladbelly were among the many musicians Mr. Seeger met. One of his primary career achievements was to let a future generation know that such people as Woody and Ladbelly once lived. After he, lived, he was in the military, and you'll dig this part, amid the rampant anti-Japanese prejudice in the United States World War II, he married Toshi Aline Ota, who was a Japanese-American woman, uh, who passed away about a year ago. Joseph McCarthy... 
Republican, Wisconsin, regularly made headlines with charges of communist infiltration of government agencies, academia, and the entertainment industry. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> In the last 12 years, during uh, George W. Bush administration, you remember, remember that uh, the problem with America was that the people who were teaching in colleges were too liberal and that they were poisoning the minds of America with peace and freedom. In 1955, the Un-American Activities Committee became a communist influence in professional entertainment and subpoenaed Mr. Seeger. And he said to them, I think these are very improper questions for any American to be asked, especially under such compulsion as this. He was jailed for contempt of Congress. He beat the charge. This is what he said about being a communist. I apologize for once believing Stalin was just a hard driver, not a supremely cruel dictator. I asked people to broaden their definition of socialism. Our ancestors were all socialists. You killed a deer, and maybe you got the best cut, but you wouldn't let it rot. You shared it. Similarly, I tell socialists, every society has a post office, and none of them is efficient. <laughs> no post office anywhere invented Federal Express. Uh, he bought uh, seven uh, acres in, uh, in the Hudson River in New York, and he fought for them. I call them all love songs, he once said of his music. They tell the love of a man and a woman, parents and children, love of country, freedom, beauty, mankind, the world, love of searching for truth and other unknowns, but love alone is not enough. Uh, a mentor to Bob Dylan, Don McLean, Bernice Johnson, Regan, who founded Sweet Honey in the Rock, uh, Springsteen, you may remember, did a record a few years ago called We Shall Overcome the Seeger Sessions and did a tour of it. In 2009, he did uh, Woody Guthrie's This Land is Your Land with Mr. Seeger at the Obama inaugural. You may remember Bruce uh, Springsteen singing that with him there. Um, in any case, uh, Mr. Seeger is definitely swirling down that great river uh, that leads to the end of the universe. And you can see him and feel his all-encompassing embrace and his uh, tiny, reedy uh, hands and uh, a high voice uh, singing as he plucks the banjo for all eternity. He made life better.